engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. Going. What that essentially means is discovery is advances, advances, questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is The Naked Scientist. Hello and welcome to The Naked Scientist. This is the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine. I'm Chris Smith. And I'm Julia Ravy. Coming up, news of why tyres are potentially worse polluters than exhaust pipes. Will the four-day working week work? A trial has kicked off this week to find out. And archaeologists uncover the true age of the domestic chicken. Plus, we continue our analysis of alternative energy solutions. The abandoned Australian mine that's now a power station. Are domestic batteries a good investment? And why your washing machine needs to talk to the national grid. Stick around to find out why. Bad air sits at the top of the league tables as a leading cause of ill health internationally. And a lot of air pollution stems from road traffic. Notoriously, it's the fine particles in exhaust smoke that are responsible. In recent years, though, significant pressure has been brought to bear on vehicle manufacturers to clean up their emissions act. And at the same time, some areas have introduced emission control zones like the one in London that penalise polluting vehicles and drive them off the streets. But as these measures take hold, and especially as we switch to electric cars, there is one form of pollution that's rapidly becoming the elephant in the room, flying straight under the roadside radar and slipping unnoticed into those ultra emission zones and that's the particles that rub off of your tyres. Research suggests that these can be just as bad as exhaust smoke. They're also present in massive amounts as Nick Molden the CEO of Emissions Analytics has been showing. So I did some calculations and you very quickly realise you were talking about hundreds of thousands of tonnes of material being shed every year across, say, all the vehicles in Europe. In the world, there's about one and a half billion cars. If they are shedding even relatively small amounts of material, that adds up to a very large amount. At last, the regulations have got on top of tailpipe emissions. But it doesn't mean that cars don't have other sources of pollution. Uh, Brakes is one, but the one that we think is the biggest and growing is tyres. What is most important for us to think about and regulators to get their head round, it is now tyres, not the tailpipe. Do we have any feel, though, for the relative nastiness of emissions from tailpipes versus tyres? Because we've got quite familiar with what these small particles are, how big they are, which are the worst ones, what sorts of impacts they have on human health when we breathe them in. Do we have any data on what comes off of a tyre and in what sort of quantity and what its link to disease risk is? There's a certain intuitive understanding that, or belief rather than understanding that tyres are largely made up of natural rubber. And because that's natural, that can't be that bad. Well, it turns out, particularly in car tyres and van tyres, this is not true. Actually, natural rubber makes up a pretty small proportion, maybe a quarter maximum. Most of it is synthetic rubber derived from crude oil. And that brings us to a really interesting parallel with fossil fuel vehicles in that we are using derivatives of crude oil to create the tyres. And so the pollutants coming off tyres are, in a way, you know, cousins of what's coming out of the tailpipe. And so we are seeing a lot of the same common compounds And one group particularly to flag is what's called aromatics. Many of them are carcinogenic to humans. If we compare across the hundreds of tyres we've now analysed, that proportion of aromatics varies between about 25% at the low end to 80% at the high end. What that says to me is, one, those are high figures anyway across the board, but also that they vary hugely from tyre to tyre. The thing is, Nick, the mere fact they are there is a bit like me saying, well, I know there's some asbestos in the building that I'm working in, but as long as I don't fiddle with it, I'm quite safe. If the carcinogen stays in the tyre or stays on the road surface, 
that's not, in theory, a threat to my health, is it? So have we got evidence that this is coming off the tyre and potentially exposing people and therefore increasing their risk of onward disease? So there's three directions these particles take. Uh, the smallest ones make up about 11% of the mass uh, and they will hang in the air for quite a while and are subject to human inhalation. They are sufficiently small to transfer into the blood and potentially into the brain. There is now a reasonable amount of evidence that that's not a good thing. But what happens to the other 89%? Our estimates say that probably roughly equally that is split between it going into the water and into the soil, which then can find its way into the food chain. If we just think a bit more about the, the marine direction, the research is at really early stages at the moment, but the one notable thing that's happened recently is in America, they have linked the effect of one compound from tires, which only comes from tires, to the deaths of salmon and now to breeds of trout as well. Now, I know that's fish and not people, but that gives us sufficient cause to think there's enough reason to believe there's a risk that these aromatics will be getting into humans. That's a worry, isn't it? Nick Molden there. Well, five days a week, nine to five. That is the employment pattern that most jobs have adopted ever since it was introduced about 100 years ago. And in the century that's followed, productivity has soared. But working hours, that nine to five routine, has remained the same. And with the pandemic provoking many people to reconsider their priorities in life, some of these old working patterns have started to be questioned. Can, for instance, employees maintain 100% of their output for 100% of their wages, but work just 80% of the time instead? Well, that's the hypothesis that's being tested in a new trial that's begun with some UK businesses this week. And Julia spoke to Brendan Burchill, who's at the University of Cambridge and monitoring the trial data to find out what it's all about. We've got a big trial in the UK. It's following the model in other countries. We've got 70 employers covering about 3,000 employees who all are going to go down to a working time reduction model. Typically, it will be a 20% reduction in their working week, while they're aiming as well that people shouldn't get a pay cut. And they will be just as productive as they were before. So they'll be doing the same amount of work, but working smarter and getting it done by Thursday so they can have a three-day weekend. So you're getting a bit less time in work, but the expectation is to have the same output. So is there sort of a science behind that being possible? We've got some experience of other organisations have experimented with this and overall the results seem to be very positive. People really enjoy having that extra leisure time, being able to have a more relaxed weekend, be able to do things in their own time and realising that there were ways in which they could work more effectively, whether it can work in all situations, how we need to tailor it to different situations, what sort of mentoring and assistance we can give to organisations, those are still open questions and we'll know the answer to lots of these things in six months or so when the trial ends. And how are you going to monitor the success of the trial? We're taking lots of different measures. But for instance, on the productivity, we rely on organisations to define themselves. What is the most important output they want? Is it to do with the profit? Is it to do with the quality of their service? And we'll use their own metrics. We'll also be looking at the employee well-being, looking at their mental health, and also trying to get some indication of the carbon footprint that we're hoping is going to be improved by these changes to people's working lives. Was this an opt-in process? It was, and there's been publicity around a a small number of organisations in the UK that have done this. It's interesting just how much interest this has had, both from employees, but also from employers. On the employer side of things, I was surprised that so many were keen on it. Have any had the attitude of, well, if my employees can do it in four days, I should just pay them for four days? I haven't come across that. Again, I mean, they're all different. Employers tend to be very proud of what they're doing and want to work with employees on this. That's the impression we're getting from talking to the employers anyway. Sometimes it's because they want to recruit and they were finding it difficult to recruit and thought that would be one way that could really attract the best talent. In other cases, it was because they were particularly in the business of welfare. And in some cases, the profit motive wasn't the main thing that they were interested in. They were more interested in their service to local community, in how they treat their employees. This type of trial 
can apply to, I guess, many different industries. Are there any industries which would struggle to adopt this? I'm thinking like the healthcare industry, because I guess at the minute in the UK, at least, we're massively understaffed with healthcare. And so would we have to like up the staff numbers then to maintain this type of model? Certainly there are some sorts of employers that can do it more easily. That's our experience so far, particularly when you've got professionals working quite autonomously, like architects or people doing programming. And often people's initial reaction when I tell them about this is, well, you couldn't do it in hospitals, for instance. But of course, when you think about it, hospitals, typically some parts of them anyway, do run 24-7, but nobody's expected to be there for the whole time. You're trying to run a seven-day service using typically people working five days and eight hours a day. So it's, it's actually relatively easy to think how you'd modify that. Again, as you say, there are recruitment problems and staff shortages in lots of parts of the UK economy at the moment. There's also lots of people who I think would be better off if they had some work and if work was made available to them instead of only in a full time manner, but where they could get good quality jobs that would also allow them more time off to do whatever they want to do. So if we can provide work to people that allows them a better work life balance, then I'm hoping that we get a lot more people who are currently out of the late market into work. Are you working a four-day week at the minute? No, I, I reduced my hours down to three days a week about a year and a half ago with the university. Even better. But no, I definitely have been enjoying a slightly more relaxed pace of work, spending a lot more time with my grandchildren. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. Be lovely if we could all do that, wouldn't it? Brendan Birchill there discussing the four-day working week trial that's just kicked off. What do you make of that? Not everyone's convinced. Some commentators like the Daily Telegraph's Annabelle Denham highlighted the risk that the trial will suffer from what is dubbed the Hawthorne effect, where, as she put it, participants will modify their behaviour in the knowledge it's being observed and revert to previous practices when the circus has moved on. Well, we will circle back and see. Still to come, archaeologists have discovered where chickens came from and when. Plus, is it worth installing a battery to power your home? Before that, though, the UK government have pledged to stamp out smoking by the year 2030. With good reason, smoking causes premature deaths of millions of people worldwide every year. Just here in the UK, the death toll is the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every day. Well, this week, an independent report was published by former Bernardo's chief executive, Javid Khan, looking at what needs to happen to realise this goal of a smoke-free country within about two decades. With us is Edinburgh University's Linda Bold, whose own work looks at this very same topic. What are they proposing, Linda? Well, Chris, I think the way to describe this is it's the last big push. So if you think back to the 1950s, we had over 80% of men who smoked. We got up to about just under half of women in the 1960s. And now we've got the second lowest rates in Europe. So smoking is concentrated in particular groups. And what they're effectively recommending, he's got 15 recommendations. It's quite a comprehensive approach. And it has elements that are around prevention, raising the uh, age of sale every year. So that means that at the moment it's 18 and it would gradually become even older in terms of uh, when people would be allowed to smoke. And then they're also looking at investments in services, in vaping as an alternative for smokers, looking at pregnant women, um, looking at uh, mental health and smoking really importantly. So a whole variety of really quite ambitious measures to try and get us over the line to 2030. We'll come on to some of the specifics in just a second, but is there any evidence that packages like this actually work? There is, actually. So in 1962, the Royal College of Physicians produced Smoking and Health, which set out a package of measures that should be implemented. It actually took 50 years. But as they were implemented in stages, and that meant raising the price, banning marketing, offering people support, when you change the environment and you change behaviour together over time, it really does have an impact. And in fact, smoking is probably the best example in public health of a comprehensive approach and things acting together. So, you know, I, I don't know whether much or any of this will get implemented, but if they actually did implement it, I would be really quite confident this would be adding to what we already have and make a real difference. Playing devil's advocate, though, for a second, Linda, heroin is universally illegal and there's no age at which that's considered acceptable, yet we have, unfortunately, a steady stream of victims 
every year and young people join that list of victims every year, despite many of the measures being in place that you've already mentioned. So what's the evidence that we'll crack down on smoking and get that last about 15% of people who do smoke with these measures if we can't do it for something as severe as heroin addiction? Well, they're very different drugs in different ways. And also the drug death issue has actually be, be, been getting worse, whereas what you've seen in tobacco control are consistent improvements. And I think there are a couple of things there. The first thing is that it's uniquely harmful um, and people know the risks and also it's been denormalized. Um, so gradually it's just become less acceptable to smoke. And then importantly, there are also alternatives that people have in terms of nicotine replacement therapy, which some people actually, a committee I shared for NICE, said you could use it for life if you wanted to. Um, so I know people who are still using NRT lozenges and they stopped smoking 10 years ago. So nicotine is not the problem. We don't need to abandon the actual drug that's addictive because it's not causing harm. It's the burning and the tobacco, also oral tobacco, that causes the harm. So I think it's quite a different scenario. And just in the last half minute or so, one of the recommendations is let's offer people vaping as an alternative. Is that not possibly substituting one poison for another, though? Well, vaping is not risk free. And it's really important to emphasize that. But the thing I come back to the burning, Chris, smoking kills one in two of its regular users. In fact, two in three of its regular users when used as intended. Vaping has a very small proportion of that risk. We don't have the long term um, data, but for smokers, it's definitely the better option. The challenge, of course, Chris, is to keep it out of the hands of non-smokers and young people because we don't know long term how it might affect them. Indeed. Linda, thanks very much for bringing us up to speed. That's uh, Linda Bold. From baffling British weather the sideways spines of the vertebrae coming off here to looking at a cheetah from the inside out. Games making their way to the clinic and what to eat in your garden. Mm. The Naked Scientists In Short podcasts bring you a top-up of short, compelling science stories. Listen and download for free at nakedscientist.com slash short or subscribe to Naked Specials wherever you get your podcasts. Earlier studies on the modern chicken Gallus domesticus had claimed it originated some 10,000 years ago in China and Southeast Asia, with the earliest European chickens supposedly dating back 7,000 years. Now, scientists around the world have been collaborating to put this claim to the test and have found that certain samples have been inaccurately dated by thousands of years, meaning chickens are actually much younger in evolutionary terms than we first thought. The two studies published in the journals Antiquity and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA were carried out by academics at a number of universities around the world, including Cardiff, where Julia Best is based. She told James Titko what they found. So the methods that have been used prior to our studies to assign the age to these chickens have been indirect and that means they've been associated by the archaeological context in which the bones were found things like types of pottery coins things that can give us an approximate date one of the methods we used is radiocarbon dating which is a direct form of dating that rate of radioactive decay gives us as archaeologists a ticking timer to measure and what sort of errors were you able to rectify with this much more accurate dating technique? One really good example comes from Bulgaria in Europe, where a specimen was thought to be about 7,000 years old. But when we did radiocarbon dating, it was actually revealed to be less than 100 years old. Other ones were still ancient, but were much more recent than previously thought. For example, maybe being Roman and medieval in date rather than much earlier, such as Bronze Age or Iron Age. Can I move us on to think about what we know about when chickens were first being domesticated, what, th what their evolutionary ancestors may have been and what instigated people taking mm. them into their homes and into their communities? The theory we're putting forward at the moment is that it may have been to do with rice cultivation. 
as cereal crops start to be domesticated in this area, such as Thailand, what we're seeing is a really nice correlation between the date of this crop domestication and the date where we're first seeing chickens in the archaeological record. So maybe the clearing of jungle areas for rice cultivation fields could have created an appropriate environment for the red jungle fowl, the chicken's primary ancestor, which could have then been attracted into the human niches based on the availability of food, among other things. And when we start to see chickens coming over to the West, so firstly, Mm. when? And secondly, are they coming over the animal that we now view as as a common source of food, whether for their eggs or for their meat, or were they coming over in, in a different capacity? We now think that they did not arrive in Europe until the first millennium BC, probably about 800 BC. So out of the 23 bones that we radiocarbon dated, 18 of them were much more recent than had been claimed. So now that we can rule out those intrusive chickens, we can get a better understanding of what people were actually doing with them and how they were interacting. Let's take Britain as an example for now. When these animals first arrive, chickens do not seem to be primarily considered as food. The earliest chickens that we have in Britain are buried alone in pits. They're whole animals. They're not butchered. And they seem to have lived to quite a ripe old age. And so this indicates more that they have a special status. Maybe they're considered exotic. Maybe they are a status symbol. And they might also have ritual religious connotations it takes perhaps up to 500 years from a chicken's first appearance in an area for them to be more considered as a common food do we have a sense of what changes the chicken has gone through since it was first domesticated because it strikes me that the modern chicken serves a lot of purposes for humans as they currently are which may have not been so useful in the wild being such efficient layers of eggs for example or having such meaty flesh. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, that is a really important change. Some of the early changes may have been to do with their outer aesthetics. So what do they look like? But some of the key changes you pick up on there are things like the ability to lay frequently. We know that it must be quite soon after chickens are domesticated that they have the capacity to lay regularly but we don't know whether that was actually selected for until much later on so maybe things like egg laying weren't the most important to begin with. That was Julia Best speaking with James Titko on new research shedding light on the origin of the domestic chicken that was published in Antiquity this week. Trying to unpick how our planet began to form, and from what, over five billion years ago, sounds like a pretty impossible undertaking. But by studying the leftovers from the process of planet formation in the early solar system, we can decipher what the conditions were like and what materials were there at the time. The problem remains, of course, where you get that material. But this week, this cosmic detective story did take a big step forward with the publication of analysis of samples that were collected from an ancient asteroid called Ryugu by the Japanese space agency JAXA. Samples were brought back aboard their Hayabusa 2 probe and are now being studied. So I asked the Open University's space scientist John Zarnecki to bring me up to speed on what the results are revealing. This mission, Hayabusa 2, is from JAXA and it was their second asteroid return mission. These are very demanding and challenging, but both of them have worked and have returned samples to the Earth. Now, in the case of Hayabusa 2, it was launched in 2014, returned with its samples in 2020, and the total amount that was collected was about five and a half grams. You might laugh at that, but Actually, five and a half grams is a lot more than they expected. And these days, with the incredible analytical equipment that we have in in laboratories on the Earth, you can do an enormous amount with small quantities of material. The paper's got hundreds of scientists on it. Well, I I tried to count, Chris, and I made it 149. (laughs) Right. And it's, from 65 different laboratories on four continents. And I mean, that in itself is interesting. That 
shows you the nature of much of science these days. A lot of science is done by large teams collaborating internationally, bringing different types of expertise to bear. And um, what has this pretty substantial team demonstrated with this paper? I mean, what are the key findings? There's a couple of things that stand out to me. First of all, it's ironic that it's actually saying in some ways more about material here on the Earth than on this particular asteroid. We have thousands of meteorites in various collections on the Earth, and they fall into different categories. And there's one particular category, and there are only a few of this type. They're called uh, CI meteorites, and they are thought to be the most primitive with material representing that that existed very, very early in the life of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. One of the reasons this asteroid was chosen as a target is that it's thought to be a primitive asteroid. And the first analysis published a few months ago sort of confirmed that that seems to be the case. Now, in this paper, this large group analyzed the material and compared it with the samples that we have in the meteorite collection. And they found that, broadly speaking, the material was the same, but there were some significant differences. Now, we always worry with meteorites, to what extent are they contaminated by, in many cases, sitting on the Earth for tens or even hundreds of years? This paper is really showing this is what this material should look like. And anything more that we see in these uh, samples on the Earth are due to contamination. What really struck me when I read this paper, and I'll quote from part of the introduction, they say, the samples consist predominantly of minerals formed in aqueous fluid, in other words, water, on a parent planetesimal, a planet that was trying to form the primary minerals were altered by fluids at a temperature of 37 degrees C, give or take, and have not subsequently been heated to more than 100 degrees. I mean, that's amazing detail to be able to say about what this asteroid was going through about 5 billion years ago. That is the power of what, what is often called cosmochemistry. They can look at the details of the mineralogy, the structure. From that, you can decipher the formation conditions because, you know, certain compounds will only form under certain conditions of temperature and pressure. And that's the way in which you can do this detective work. You can essentially map out the conditions that existed in at least one part of the early solar system. It's staggering, yes. It truly is. Thanks to John Zarnecki there for taking a look at the latest findings published this week in the journal Science from the asteroid samples returned to Earth by Japan's Hayabusa 2 mission. Much has changed for business owners, managers and staff recently. But with over 30 years experience in telecommunications, award-winning independent company Spitfire have the expertise to make sure you stay ahead and can keep on innovating. Whether it's connectivity, MPLS networks, firewalls or phone systems, Spitfire can help. To find out more, go to spitfire.co.uk. That's spitfire.co.uk. Spitfire, telecoms and IP engineering solutions for business since 1988. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Julia Ravy, and with Chris Smith. Now, over the last month, prompted by the energy crisis and the cost of living crisis, climate change and also the UK's very ambitious target to reach net zero by 2050, we've been looking at some of the alternative energy sources that are available to us and we've been asking how practical and how viable are they. Well, to round off that series, this week we're going to explore one of the biggest challenges of all, which is how we store and distribute this energy. One key issue is that the sun doesn't shine at night and wind speed isn't constant, nor is it necessarily sunny or windy where the consumers are. So we need ways to make metaphorical hay or electricity when the sun is shining, 
store it and then redistribute it where we need it. This means we have multiple challenges to surmount to make this happen, ranging from economic systems and government policies to smarter technologies and perhaps even new ways of working or organising our lives. Simon Harrison is an electrical engineer and joins us now. He is head of strategy for the engineering company Mott MacDonald. So, Simon, this is not just a question of building some wind turbines and putting in solar panels to solve this problem, is it? No, I'm afraid it isn't. Um, those are component parts of an energy system that we need to decarbonize globally by 2050. So that's not very long away. It's only 330 months, I calculated. And we have to do that affordably. And we have to, have to do that in a way that is resilient and reliable. And that's a massive challenge. So that's not about picking a few technologies and, and deploying them. It needs an approach that considers the energy system as a whole at a strategic level. So we have to worry about economics, policy, technology, networks, digital, markets, supply chains, regulation, how efficiently we use energy and how we behave. And at the same time, we have to think about that at all scales. So national, regional, city, community, they all have a different part to play. And we have to make all of that fit together in the best way that produces an affordable answer for you and me. It sounds like a lot of steps to consider. So what is the order in which we need to put these things in place? The issues that drive all this, I think, are pace and scale. There's a lot of discovery involved because we don't yet know all of the best answers, even though we probably know most of the technologies. And we need to test and deploy multiple approaches at scale. We can't assume that we make a policy based on something working. There may be all sorts of issues as to how much things end up costing, whether there are supply chains that can produce things at enough scale uh, and so on, and how that's working out uh, around the world. And we need to learn fast, change our approach, and then scale again. There are some clear kind of immediate needs. We need a policy environment, a digital backbone on what I would expect to be a much more digitalized system, and support for innovation, both uh, innovation at big scale, things like um, better nuclear or offshore wind, um, and innovation at perhaps much more local scale about how energy needs to be better integrated locally. And we're currently in this cost of living crisis. So all of these interventions that are needed in the future, they sound great, but probably very costly. Is this going to be cost effective down the line? Well, we have to decarbonise by 2050. If we don't do that in a thoughtful, planned way that thinks about the system as a whole, it will end up costing a lot more money. So this will cost money, uh, but this is about spending as little money as we have to to achieve the end goal. If we don't take a systems view, we'll make far more mistakes. We'll have to rectify things later. Alternatively, we, we might well end up um, missing the target. If we find out how to scale new approaches, costs tend to come down dramatically. And the evidence from, say, solar and wind is very much the case. Both of those are much, much cheaper than they were 10 or 15 years ago. So with these interventions in place, would the hope be that prices of electricity will be more stable in the long run because we have these storage systems in place. An energy system based on a much broader mix of sources, including much more um, renewable energy and appropriate and well-integrated storage and smart end use, using energy demand as, as something that can be varied as the wind blows and the sun's out, all offers opportunity to a much more price-stable uh, energy system uh, in the long term, although none of these things will have a big impact on prices in the short term, unfortunately. Simon Harrison from Mott MacDonald, thank you very much. Now, when it comes to storing energy, you don't have to actually store electricity, although advances in battery technology do mean it is becoming much more practical to do that, as we'll be hearing a bit later on in the programme when we talk about the rising trend towards installing domestic batteries to power our homes. One alternative, very attractive energy storage solution, is in fact hydrogen. It's very easy to make. You pass electricity generated from a renewable source like solar into water and you use the electrical energy to split the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen and the hydrogen you can send down pipes so that people can burn it or use it in various industrial ways or you can feed it into devices called fuel cells that reverse the splitting reaction, recombine the hydrogen and the oxygen and they return electricity and water. Physicist Dave Ansell is one of the world's best science demo developers, so we asked him to show Harry Lewis how it all works. Here we go. Oh, what a space. 
Yeah, I didn't expect yeah. this at all. Yeah, so there's a metal working lathe, uh, filler drill, manual milling machine, uh, oh, it, it, the table. It's like the TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming to down the bottom of the garden. It's outrageous. So, Dave, what have we got? What's in front of us? So what I've got is two wires which will be coming from the solar panels, effectively. And they're basically just connected to two wires in some water. This is electrolysis, isn't it, that we're going to be carrying out? Yes. So what we're doing is we're passing electricity through water, effectively. The way electricity passes through a liquid like water, something which is ionic, is you actually get ions moving. So you get positive hydrogen ions moving one way and negative OH minus ions going the other way. And when the hydrogen ions reach the negative electrode, which they're attracted to, they will form hydrogen gas. And when the OH minus ions reach the positive electrode, they'll form oxygen gas. So if we hit the switch on that, are we going to so start we'll... that current up or provide that voltage? Yeah, we'll hit the switch. And if you look closely... Mm, bubbles off both sides. Yeah, so you can see there's more bubbles being created on the hydrogen side than the oxygen side because water's H2O. So you get twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. How do we actually know that we have hydrogen and oxygen? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some soap to this water, which will hopefully mean the bubbles will be more stable. And we can mix that in. And we will wait for a bit and hopefully be able to collect a pile of bubbles of hydrogen and or oxygen. Whilst we've got a little bit of time because the bubbles are forming in our soapy mixture, what would we then use that for? So one thing you can actually do, in fact, with this demo, is if you just um, leave the electrodes in there and there are some bubbles trapped on them, you can plug it into a voltmeter and it will generate a voltage. Huh. Yeah, it's not very stable here. It's not a very good system <laughs> because you totally lose the gas, um, which is only just stuck onto the wires. But if you can build a proper fuel cell, you can basically produce a battery which you can recharge by adding hydrogen and oxygen to it. Right, interesting. And if you weren't to make a fuel cell, is there any other way that we could make use of this hydrogen? Well, the simplest thing would be to just burn it. So you can just put it into the pipes and supplement your um, natural gas with something more environmentally friendly. However, that seems to me to be a bit of a waste because there are all sorts of things which you do first which need hydrogen. So things like making fertiliser, which is a big issue at the moment. All nitrogen fertilisers are made from nitrogen gas and hydrogen, which you react together at high pressure to create ammonia. And I mean, people are talking about smelting iron using hydrogen instead of carbon, which again would decarbonise another industry. So we're bubbled up. Does that mean we're ready to go? What, what do we do now? So here's a match. Oh, that was so much louder than I expected. That was good, wasn't it? That was good. <laughs> uh, there's a squeaky pop, as you learned in school, hydrogen should produce. Hydrogen did produce a squeaky pop. So that pop has obviously released a load of energy, which we've stored by electrolyzing the water. And obviously that's the energy which you then get back in a fuel cell or by burning the hydrogen, which we just did. Thanks to Dave Ansell for that squeaky pop there, who was speaking with Harry Lewis. Another way to store energy is to use gravity. If you use electricity to push something up a hill, you've given it gravitational potential energy. And you can get that energy back by letting the thing roll back down the hill. And if you do this with water, you've got the basis of what's called a pump storage hydroelectric system. And this is what engineers have been able to do in one part of Queensland in Australia. In a world first, they've turned a flooded, abandoned mine pit at Kidston into a system that uses solar energy to pump water out of the mine pit during the day and then it provides power for a nearby town all through the night. Mott McDonald's Ashley Grone tell me how it works. The Kidston project converts an old 100-year-old gold mine and repurposes it into a gravity hydro pump storage project. It's a fascinating project because the mine workings left a 300 metre pit in the ground, which for reference is now that I'm sitting in London is about the height of the Shard. Over time it is filled with water and what the project does is it uses that 300 metre height differential to store energy in a top reservoir and generate energy through turbines 
dumping the water into the lower reservoir and then it recycles the water back up to the top reservoir to store it so that it can be used on basically on a daily basis. Is this an open cast pit or, or are we talking old mine workings, tunnels etc here? It is an open cast pit and the spoil left from the mine workings has uh, created the upper reservoir and the 300 metre deep pit is, uh, is the lower reservoir for the pump storage scheme. And how big is that pit then? If you were a golfer, it's about a, uh, a driver and a short iron, so approximately 300 or 400 metres, depending on how good you are at golf, across, if you can imagine, a conical-shaped um, pit in the ground. So how much water's in there? Um, it's in excess of 3,000 Olympic swimming pools, and the pump storage scheme basically pumps 2,000 Olympic swimming pools up the hill over an eight-hour period and then can flow the same uh, quantity of water down through the turbines to generate the power in an eight-hour period. I presume that the rationale for doing this is you could use electricity that you've produced in a green way to power those pumps. So you're basically using renewables to push the water uphill and store that energy as, as gravity. Then you, you can turn the taps on when you want that energy back when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. That's absolutely correct, Chris. So in Australia in particular, we have excess solar power generated during the day. So there is excess and very cheap solar energy to pump the water up the hill. And then when everybody comes home of an evening and switches on their air conditioning in Australia or, or boils their kettle in the morning, we can generate power from that water stored during the day to meet the needs of consumers during the night and the, and the morning peaks. How much energy will this thing put out? How powerful is it? Um, in technical terms, it's a 250 megawatt scheme and can generate for eight hours. So as a point of reference, that's basically enough to power 100,000 homes. Right. And, and so when those people come home from work, this thing just basically turns on and runs all night. And so they've got power coming from this project all night. It has the potential to run all night. That's correct. Really, its primary purpose is um, as we're retiring uh, conventional coal-fired power plant, there is potential for pump storage and even bigger projects than this in Australia to basically, yes, keep the lights on and keep industry moving that works on a 24-hour cycle. I suppose one other benefit here, you, you mentioned coal, is that traditionally when people have uh, turned the TV on and then the adverts have come on and they've put the kettle on or their favourite programme finishes and they put the kettle on or, or there's just anticipation of people coming home in the evening, a bit like you said, and putting the aircon on, they have to turn the coal-fired power stations on an hour or more before they want that surge because it takes that long to heat things up presumably yours, because it's literally the water is sitting there ready to go. It's just a press of a button and you're up to full output instantly. That's a good analogy, Chris. Whereas a coal-fired plant will take hours to heat up, a pumped hydro scheme can basically go from zero to full output in, in one to two minutes. How much does it cost to implement? I mean, is this something which is a realistic prospect? Or do you need very specific conditions to make something like this work? Yes, at, at the moment, I guess when we look at the energy trilemma, that balance between sustainability and, and energy security, but also importantly price, at the moment, uh, especially in the Australian market, um, you really do need a, um, a pump storage scheme that works um, in your favour economically um, for it to be comparable with, uh, with other technologies. And, and that was the beauty of the Kidston project because essentially the big holes were already in the ground and there was already significant infrastructure at site, in, including actually a, a solar farm that had already been built. It economically stacked up and it is the, the first project in 40 years built in Australia in terms of hydro and it is the first project that has actually been privately financed. I presume one could now take the blueprint for doing this because you, you must have data to die for in terms of how to implement this, how it works, what the pitfalls are, literally as well as metaphorically, in terms of being able to extrapolate this, upscale it, downscale it and, and distribute it across the world. There must be lots of places where this would be an ideal fit. Absolutely, Chris. There is a lot of learnings, especially when you're looking at um, repurposing uh, an old mine workings. Um, 
And certainly the International Hydro Association has been looking at this, as well as most countries globally, looking at the opportunities, and there is absolutely no shortage. In, in Australia alone, there are literally thousands of potential opportunities uh, for pump storage that have been identified. It's an amazing project, isn't it? Ashley Grown there. This week, we're continuing our look at alternative energy and exploring the best ways to store and distribute the power we generate. Coming up, smart grids. Will your washing machine and power shower be talking to the national grid in the future? Sounds like it'd be an interesting conversation, wouldn't it? Before that, though, increasingly homeowners are adding solar panels to the roofs of their houses to help offset their power bills. The problem is that during the day, when it's sunniest and when their system is generating at its maximum output... Most people aren't at home, so they can't easily run the washing machine or charge up the car or put on the hot water to make the most of it. And although you do get paid to export your homemade electricity onto the grid, the rate of payment is much lower than you have to pay when you buy that electricity back off the grid at night time when you are home and you need the lights on. One way around this is to install a battery system that stores up what you generate during the day and then powers your home with that energy through the night. But how practical is this? What is involved? And do the numbers stack up? Chris Jardine is founder of Joju Solar, who supply these systems. And previously, he ran a research group at Oxford University looking into solar energy and micro generation. So, Chris, how does this work? It's comparatively simple. A battery system will be installed alongside the solar panels in your house, connected into your main fuse board. And when it detects that there's an excess of, of solar energy being produced uh, by the solar panels, it will charge up that battery. And similarly, if it detects that there's a higher load in the house and, and the, the, the home wants to import energy from the grid, uh, then it will discharge that battery uh, to balance that off to zero. And how much energy can be stored in these batteries? Say it's a really, really sunny day and you've got sun on those panels all day. How much can you store up? Batteries come in in a variety of sizes, but uh, let me give you an example of uh, the Tesla Powerwall, which is probably the most popular battery uh, being installed in the UK. The Tesla Powerwall will store 13 and a half kilowatt hours of electricity, which compares to the demand of an average home of around about 10 kilowatt hours. So the Tesla Powerwall will be installing you roughly a day's worth uh, of electricity in that battery. Smaller batteries might be around about half the size, perhaps around about five kilowatt hours. And what is the output? So say you've got a family of four and it's night time, so there's no sun, we're relying solely on these batteries. Everyone's got their gadgets out. Is this going to be a doable thing with this type of battery? It depends on the size of the battery you purchase, but certainly the Tesla Powerwall, which has a, a five kilowatt power output, uh, would be capable of, of meeting, you know, lighting, TV loads in the home, as well as sort of major heating loads uh, like, a, like a kettle or an oven. Smaller batteries would have a, a smaller power output, maybe two or three kilowatts, uh, and they may struggle to meet those peaks in demand that come from uh, high powered heating appliances. A problem with batteries is their lifetime. So we have terrible phone batteries, which have got better over the years. But what is the lifetime of these batteries that will be installed? Yeah, so we're seeing the sort of typical warranties on these batteries uh, being around about uh, 10 years, uh, which means that we probably expect their, their useful lifetime to be extending out uh, around maybe 15 to, to 20 years. And certainly the data that's that's coming off some of these early battery systems that have been going in over uh, the past five years or so is that actually the batteries themselves seem to be holding up very well and not degrading too much. And there's going to be an upfront cost for getting one of these batteries installed. So what is the payback period for this? Yeah, so if you'd asked me this question about a year ago, I would have said that the payback of a, a solar system on its own compared to a, a solar and battery system in the home would have been a roughly equal. Um, the, the battery itself would have had very minimal impact either way uh, on the payback of, of that overall home energy system that, that you'd be putting in. Reason for that, as we've discussed, is obviously the benefit comes from 
the export payment for solar electricity, which is around about five pence per kilowatt hour, and the import price for electricity, uh, which historically was sitting at around about 15 pence per kilowatt hour. That difference is, is really what's provided uh, the, the, the benefit, the financial benefits of installing a battery. But obviously that has to be offset against the capital cost of, of the battery system itself. So historically, we weren't seeing a, a lot of difference there. And we were seeing people installing batteries really for much more emotive reasons based around wanting to be more self-sufficient, wanting to be independent from the dirty electricity grid. Clearly, the picture's changed over the last year, and now we're seeing electricity import prices up around 25 to 30 pence per kilowatt hour. Then I think there is now a financial case for, for installing batteries, uh, and that you would see um, solar systems with batteries incorporated into them uh, giving improved payback periods uh, compared to just installing solar on its own. And just in the last 30 seconds here, with the current energy crisis, has demand for these batteries at home gone up? Yeah, I mean, demand for, for both solar and battery storage has gone through the roof really since last October when people started getting worried about electricity prices. There was another big bump in, in March when, when the Ukraine crisis broke as well. And certainly at times we've seen demand for solar and battery systems running about 10 times normal levels at the minute. Wow. Well, thank you, Chris Jardine from Joju Solar. Now, apart from just storing energy, another approach is to actually use what we do have more effectively and in a more timely way. Now, the load on our energy supply rises and falls all the time meaning there are periods when there are relative surpluses and there are other times when we face shortfalls and those shortfalls often necessitate switching on expensive and usually very carbon unfriendly fallback systems. So if we can make our energy systems more intelligent and flexible in their consumption patterns, we could make some significant savings. But what does this involve and is it really realistic? Sarah Darby is at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute, where she works on what are called smart energy systems. Sarah, welcome to the programme. In a nutshell then, is this really the power station telling my fridge that it's OK to turn on right now? This is one of the most exciting areas of energy research at the moment, I think. It's what Simon referred to at the beginning. It's about looking at the system as a whole and integrating demand with supply. We already have supermarket freezers helping with the power system by adjusting their demand according to the available supply, using more when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining. So we could see a time in the future when that would happen to domestic freezers and fridges as well. That, I think, would be quite a way down the road. But it has started already. Would it involve, then, really intelligent devices that are informing the supplier, this is what I am, this is how I sit in the pecking order of power. I'm a dishwasher, I don't really need to run right now, or I'm a fridge, I'm not off my temperature, I'm okay, I don't need to fire up quite yet, I can wait. Mm. And then the supplier saying, great, could you just wait because actually I've got lots of other demand at the moment, there's a big train pulling out of central station or something, grids under load. Is that how this will work? It's mm. sort of intelligent devices that feed back, almost like a smart meter in everything. Yes, indeed, that's already starting to happen. So, for example, our washing machine, I can set it to say I want the wash done in eight hours or seven hours before I go to bed. And then it will do the wash overnight and it can do that at a time that suits the network. You can do the same when charging a car. Both these are flexible types of demand. You could do that with your dishwasher or your water heater. What you wouldn't want to do it with, of course, you wouldn't want the network interrupting your TV programs or your cooking. And when you want to boil a kettle, you want to boil a kettle. So those types of demand aren't flexible, but quite a lot of types of demand are. You forgot about the most important one, of course, which is radio programmes that are naked scientists. That, that would be ring fenced by, by definition, of course, I'm Sarah. I'm terribly sorry about that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Um, but do we actually therefore need a rethink as to how our, our grid and distribution systems work? Because at the moment, we, we've got a sort of broad system where we just shove some power. If you've got a solar array on your roof or something, we just shove that power out 
into the ether and it goes somewhere, is it actually the most efficient way to use it? Because that means potentially that the energy generated in my garden is ending up in Scotland via the grid. Is that the most efficient way to work? It doesn't strike me that it is. Would, would it not be better to rethink maybe how we've got power kept locally to minimise losses of long distance transmission, for example? Yes, indeed. Yes, you do want to be using power as locally as you as you can for the, for the very reason you said. And, and so matching supply and demand locally at the substation level. And if you can do that intelligently, it also means that if, for example, you suddenly get quite a lot of new supply or new demand in a local area, you don't have to dig up the road and put a lot of new copper wiring in the ground. Mm. You can match the supply and the demand locally. And what sorts of benefits, if you sort of look on the back of an envelope of implementing this, what sort of benefits could we return by doing this? Well, there's the system level benefit. So everybody benefits from having a system that uh, it is changing. It will cost to do it. But as Simon said earlier, keeping those costs as low as you can. But there are also ways in which customers can benefit by going on tariffs that will mean they pay less if they are prepared to let the system use their load flexibly at times, as mm. long as it doesn't inconvenience them. You've done a bit of research on that. What, what do people make of surrendering control in that way? Are people fairly accepting of that? We came up with five C's that help people to accept all this. Comfort and cost, of course. Connectivity, the tech has to work properly. Control, they need user-friendly controls. And care, the last one, which people tend to forget, which is they need to have real human beings who understand this stuff and can explain it and can help them come to terms with it. Sarah Darby, thank you very much indeed. Well, that ends our mini series on looking at alternative energy sources and also ways in which we can efficiently store and redistribute the electricity we get from said sources. This seems to have really resonated with you at home. We've had lots of feedback on this topic, including Mark, who wrote to us today to say thank you very much for your recent programmes on uh, wind farms, for example. He's in Australia. He says the state of South Australia has recently installed 7,000 hot water services in homes to stabilise power variability on the grid. These work as a heat bank. They seek available energy, e.g. from rooftop solar panels, and they store it in the hot water system for use by families at night on their dishwashers for bathing and and clothes washing, etc. We also heard from Nick, who says, he's very much been enjoying the series so far on energy and he has some concerns over the whole question about how we balance the needs of the many and what the grid is doing at any one moment in time. I hope that some of what Sarah was just saying there, Nick, actually got to the root of some of the problems and questions that you quite rightly and quite accurately highlighted. Meanwhile, if you have any other thoughts, comments or feedback on these programmes we've been making recently or you'd like to suggest another such series of topics we can examine, please do write to us. It's chris at thenakedscientist.com. Julia. And that is all we have time for this week, but do join us next week where we will be diving into the science behind some of the news stories that have been coming out over the past month. The Naked Scientist comes to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Continuing Education. It's supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Julia Ravey. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>